So I would like to tell you something about pre-surgical language mapping, uh, but I will introduce that uh, quite extensively. And the question is basically, my question for this study was, what exactly are we testing? So first of all, I would like to uh, go through the process of word retrieval, just on a naming test, a very simple thing, and to see which brain areas we think are used to do that. Um, and then I will quickly go through some methods, how we can disrupt this process. And then I will show the uh, study where we used navigated TMS with the verb and noun test for perioperative testing, the VANPOP. Okay, now how do we retrieve a word? Um, in the OR, when a patient is uh, operated awake for, for a tumor resection, the most often used test, except for counting backwards from 10 to one, which is not language, I think, is picture naming. So they show a picture of, for example, a cat, and they ask the patient, what is this? And I will tell you how it works a bit later. But how, how does it work? What, what happens when you see a picture of a cat? So what, I, what we would like to know because of brain surgery is which parts of the brain are involved in identifying the picture. So that's the first step. You have to see what is on the picture. And then which parts of the brain are uh, involved when you activate the word cat and which parts of the brain are needed to articulate the word. So I would like you to think of a cat. Just think of a cat and you probably get a picture. And well, think about the size, the color, the shape, the sound that it makes. How many legs does it have? Does it have legs? Does it have a tail? How does it feel? Do you like cats or not? Well, probably you came up with one of these pictures of a cat. It can be black, it can be uh, white, it can be a Siamese, whatever. But these are things that you can think of when you are thinking of a cat. Maybe this. But I'm quite sure it's not a cat like this, or like this, or like this. So if you think of a cat, and I ask you to think about the size and the color and the shape, for that, you use your visual cortex. So that's your occipital lobe bilaterally. What sound does it make? Well, that's of course in your auditory memory, your auditory cortex, and that's in your temporal lobe, bilaterally again. How does it smell? Well, for that, you need your olfactory cortex. And well, it's not exactly clear where it is, but it's the temporal lobe bilaterally, people assume. Um, what does it feel like? Well, it's the sensory information. So that's in the parietal lobe, lobe bilaterally again. What does it eat and, and things like that? So that's your semantic memory of a cat, the hippocampus and both your frontal and your temporal lobe. Do you like it or do you hate it? Or are you indifferent? Emotional information, amygdala. So what you see is when you think of a cat that the information that forms your concept of a cat is spread over the entire brain in both hemispheres. It's not just in your visual cortex or the word cat is not, it's more than the word cat. So you name a picture of a cat. For that, you need to activate you see the picture and you have to match it with the concept of a cat. We are not talking about language yet. We are just talking about the, the concept that you have of a cat. And um, that information that activates the lemma of a cat. So a lemma is an abstract word form. And this abstract word form contains information about the meaning of the word, about the word class. It's not the word itself yet. It's just the, 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 the abstract word form, very abstract word form that underlies, that, that underlies the, the, the word that is later uh, produced. Um, I think it's easiest to explain that if you think of the word, if, if, if you think of the lemma, then the lemma for cat in English and Dutch is more or less the same and in English and German as well, and English and French. So how are lemmas stored in the brain? Well, let's do another small test. 
I think, what was the first word that you think of when you hear cat? Now, it's a bit difficult, of course, because you are muted, but uh, a good guess is that you do that on the basis of meaning and that it is something like dog. And that means that the concept that is, that you, the, the nonverbal concept activates a lemma and it co-activates the meaning of related lemmas like dog and mouse and mowing. And then these co-activated lemmas are inhibited and the lemma of cat wins. So that's how you select the lemma is the idea in psycholinguistics. Uh, think of Leveld, um, Garrett, etc. Okay. So where are the lemmas stored in the brain? Well, according to, uh, I refer to Indefrei here in most of the slides because I follow Indefrei here. So according to Indefrei, it is in the middle part of the left middle temporal gyrus here. That's where the lemmas are stored. Um, so once you have retrieved the lemmas, the next step is to retrieve the underlying word form. So this is the underlying word, this is the underlying, underlying word form. Uh, and these are also called lexemes. Lexemes are the underlying word forms. Uh, they are probably stored on the basis of their sound structure. So the lemma activates the lexeme and you get the same idea of activation, co-activation, inhibition. So closely related lexemes are fat and rat, are co-activated and again they are inhibited and the lexeme cat wins. Now here, to give you an idea, the lexeme cat is different in English than the lexeme cat of puss in Dutch. So this is the real word form with lexemes, with, with phonemes. Uh, according to Indevrij, the lexemes are stored in the um, left superior and middle temporal gyrus and the posterior part here, Wernicke's area basically. Okay. Now, once the lexemes has, have been found, the uh, phonemes uh, have to be filled in, they have to be filled in in the correct order and you have to apply the phonological rules. So the lexeme cat becomes cat and not fat or tech. Um, for this, and this is a very, this is a very old picture, but it's clear uh, we use the left arcuate fasciculus um, here, this is the, the, the primitive one. We now know because of the work of Catani that it, it's much more complicated, but basically it is the connection between Wernicke's area and Barocca's area. It's a subcortical tract. Um, after uh, the phonemes have been filled in and the phonological rules have been applied, you need to plan and program your articulation. So this is on the interface of language and speech. Some people say it's language, other people say it is speech, so I prefer to say it's the interface. So it's programming your articulation of the individual speech sounds, and you also have to program the smooth transition from one speech sound to the next and from one syllable to the next. That happens in uh, Broca's area, the left inferior frontal gyrus. Oh, where is it? Here. Sometimes called Dronkers area nowadays. And then you will have to articulate the word. We haven't done that yet. Um, so the word can be articulated. And for that, of course, you need, need the left and right motor and sensory cortices for mouth and neck. So here around the Rolandic fissure, both left and right. Yeah. So those of you who are uh, familiar with the physiological theories about word retrieval. Um, this will be, if you have impairment here, it's dysarthria, um, <clears throat> apraxia of speech, conduction aphasia, um, probably anomia, and probably Wernicke's aphasia. We are not sure about that concept, dementia. Okay, but that's aside. So now you can say the word cat. Okay, so to uh, recap, you, ana you do the visual analysis of the picture, you recognize the concept, uh, you retrieve the lemma, 
you retrieve the lexeme, you program your articulate, sorry, you put in the right phonemes and uh, uh, the right rules for phonological rules, you program your articulation and you articulate the word. So what you see is that basically the whole cortex and then several subcortical tracts are involved in just naming a picture of the word cat. Okay, now this also means that if you get a brain tumor, um, it can affect each of these stages or more stages. So, um, and if you have a brain tumor, the tumor will push tissue aside. And when the neurosurgeon opens the brain, he can't see what is tumor tissue and what is healthy tissue. And in order to resect the tumor, he has to uh, find out where the language areas are. Okay, for that, it is important that you disrupt the process of language, any linguistic process. Uh, so I said this, okay. So if you know where the language functions are, or if you think, well, if you think they're in the left hemisphere, for example, you can try to disrupt these linguistic, these language processes during surgery. And if the patient reacts to such a disruption, you know that you are in a language area. Um, okay, so how can we do that? Uh, there are right now, there are two ways. The one is direct cortical stimulation or direct electrical, subcort uh, electrical stimulation. It can also uh, be used subcortically, of course, but um, because I'm going to compare it with navigated transcranial magnetic stimulation, I only use the, co the uh, cortical stimulation. So uh, the cortical areas can be inhibited by using these two uh, uh, methodologies. And that means they can be identified and thus they can be spared during surgery. You don't want to uh, cut the area for uh, where the lexemes are stored away, of course. So direct cortical stimulation, this is how it works. Here you see an open brain and um, then there is this instrument and this instrument and a, a little bit of current is uh, applied to the cortex and if that area hosts a language, um, hosts language, then um, the patient will stop to talk or to count or to whatever. And I can show you an example. So here you see that the uh, neurosurgeon is uh, using the, um, uh, the, the direct current stimulation. In this case, the patient has to seize a picture and the picture here is gone, I'm sorry, but sees a picture and then has to read the sentence that is the man and then the finite verb. I don't know what the first one is because I did copy the, the slide, right? But the second one, the patient has to say the man plants and the third one he has to say the man shoots. So here we go. Okay. So what you see here, the first one was the man football, plays football, that was correct. And then his brain is stimulated and instead of the man plants, he says the man places tree, which you can consider to be a circumlocution, it's definitely not correct. And the man plants, which is a, a phonemic paraphasia, um, a sound error. So, of course, the patient has been tested with this test before. We know that he recognizes the pictures and we know that he usually, when, he is, uh, when they are not stimulating his brain, he is doing this correct. The tree shoots. So here you see uh, a perseveration from the previous item. Okay. That's TDCS. That's how it's, it's the gold standard and that's how it's uh, done usually in uh, the OR, in the main centers of brain surgery. Then navigated TMS. So what you do with navigated TMS, you give brief pulses of a high strength magnetic field through the skull on the cortex. So this can just be done when you're sitting in a chair. Uh, healthy people, it, it, no open skull needed. 
usually you stimulate with something between five and 10 Hertz. Uh, basically what you do is you depolarize the cellular membranes uh, that makes that the activation is disturbed and that results in inhibition of function. This is the technical part. I'm not involved in the technical part. So this is an alternative to language mapping because you can do this pre-operatively. And if you do this pre-operatively, that can of course help during surgery, at least to give you an idea where the language areas are. So if you do this, uh, the, uh, according to Tarapora, it can enhance surgical planning. The, 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 it's not done in many centers though. It, it, it just uh, doesn't all over the world, but they use it to, to decide in which direction uh, they, they approach the tumor. It seriously shortens the interoperative procedure. And that means of course, much less stress for both the patient and the whole surgery team. I've been in the OR and it's no fun. It's extremely interesting, but it's no fun. And it's very, very stressful. Um, according to Solman, the, the group from Munich, uh, it reduces the size of craniotomy because you know exactly how to approach the tumor again. And also, interestingly, you can prepare the patient for improperative loss of speech. I showed you the patient who <coughs> sometimes can't talk at all anymore during surgery. And if you do not know how that feels, that is very frightening. You are uh, lying there, they are uh, cutting in your brain, you are awake. And then all of a sudden you see a picture, you want to name the picture and you can't name it anymore. So that is very stressful. And you can prepare the patient by using TMS and then they know what it feels like if they know what the picture is, but they cannot say the word. So here you see the setup. Uh, there is a stereotactic navigation system. Uh, they use a figure of eight coil. I don't know if this, yes, this is a figure of eight coil. Uh, it communicates directly with the infrared camera. And uh, here you see the MRI or CT, but nowadays it's usually an MRI of the subject with the anatomical landmarks. Um, <clears throat> there is a three, it aligns with a 3D brain with a, with a physical hand. And the position of the coil is tracked in relation to the uh, cortex by the infrared camera. Then the, uh, the, the person sees a picture. Here is another camera. So everything is recorded and he or she says Apple or something else when they are, for example, stimulating the site where the lemmas are stored. Everything, as I said, is videotaped. So you can go back to the video and mark every error that the patient or the person makes. <coughs> so, you do that, that's neural navigation with NTMS. What are the advantages? Well, you can visualize each cortical region on the screen. You can see the strength and the directionality of the magnetic field. You can precisely pinpoint to the targeted region. So you can see exactly when you have the, uh, the coil in your hand, you can see exactly that here for it, that you are stimulating here. And you see that in real time. Nowadays, we, ju we just applied for an, uh, a project where, the, uh, where we use robotics or robotic arm to, to stimulate instead of manual stimulation. So it is safe and it's tolerable. So what do you need for NTMS? Well, you need, first of all, a, a participant or a patient who is cooperative and who can give you direct feedback. Um, the tasks need to be short. It needs to be shorter than four seconds. Four seconds, not so, not so much for the T NTMS, but because you want to use the same task pre-surgically as in the OR and direct cortical stimulation cannot last longer than four seconds because you will get epileptic insults. Uh, what we do, and I will show you in a sec, uh, we do baseline testing first. So we go through all the pictures with the patient or the, the well, so far it's mainly in healthy participants. And then we do stimulation session where we, and so we throw out all the pictures that he cannot name or uh, names incorrectly. And then um, we do uh, the stimulation uh, during testing and scoring. We do afterwards, we uh, go through the recordings item by item to score them. Um, there are some advantages and some disadvantages, of course, with, like with all methods, 
but keep in mind that it's all very, very new and innovative. We are just still learning, as I will show you later. Um, so there is a very high correlation between the NTMS maps and the direct cortical stimulation maps. The sensitivity and the specificity is very good. It's extremely good for um, predicting the negative sides. And it is far superior to fMRI maps that are not so, so very precise. Uh, for positive sites, it's less convincing. In the literature, you find uh, a, a range of 40 to 70%, although it's getting better. Um, my problem, not, not, not the problem of the people who are using this on a daily basis, my problem is that, and I will show you later, for example, why I'm not so sure about the onset. Um, but also not about the frequency, the duration, the intensity. What we do, we know is tolerable, but we, there must be bigger margins. So maybe we can use a higher frequency or we should use a lower frequency. Maybe we can, and especially with NTMS, we now do not longer than four seconds because uh, the TDCS, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the uh, direct cortical stimulation cannot last longer, but TMS you can do for 10 seconds or so. We have no idea what, why that would be bad, in which case you can even test sentences. And we are not sure yet about the intensity. Um, there is not a validated protocol yet. That's something that we are working on. So how can we make a protocol with good tests, with uh, the good idea how to set the parameters at the individual level in general. It's not there yet. That's what we are working on. Um, there have been a few studies to uh, uh, pre-surgical language testing. Uh, the group of Creek in Munich is very active and the group of Picht in Berlin is very active. Um, the study of Creek at all uh, he did. He had a quite detailed protocol, but that's already uh, five, six years ago that he used that. Um, but he only used object naming. And uh, Dirk already said, I'm interested in verbs. I'm interested in grammar. I mean, we talk in sentences. We don't do object naming in daily life. Um, and then there is a study from Hernandez Parou and colleagues, and they used both object and action naming, but they used infinitives. I'm not very fond of infinitives. So we, in most languages, you need finite verbs or at least inflected verbs. Um, but it turned out that object naming was a less sensitive test than action naming, which is interesting. OK, so a couple of years ago, we decided to make a test. The first version was made by Adria Rovès. Um, but that was not an, uh, an, a noun test uh, as a complement, and um, it was very much focused on Dutch. So we decided to make a new one. It has just been published um, early this year. It's called the Verb and Noun Perioperative Test, the VANPOP. So we use verbs and nouns, and they are matched on all relevant factors. So that is frequency, age of acquisition, uh, imagibility, things like that. Also, the verbs are uh, classified in transitive, intransitive, uh, instrumentality, et cetera, et cetera. Both nouns and verbs are retrieved in sentence context. Well, sentence is maybe for a linguist not really right, but at least there is a lead-in phrase. Uh, so we do action naming with inflected verbs and object naming with the article and nouns. The German, Dutch, and English test we have developed ourselves, and they are all standardized. We have all the uh relevant variables for that it has been translated to several other languages but we we no, i'll come back to that so this is what it looks like you see a picture and then above the picture there is a, a leading phrase this is and then the patient has to say a bird now in english that's not very interesting but in languages like french this is uh, basically copied from the test of dufault one of the great neurosurgeons in the world um uh, in, in French, uh, and there you have uh, feminine and masculine uh, articles. In German, you have feminine, uh, feminine, masculine, and neuter articles. So there's a li little bit more grammar in other languages than in English. <laughs> That's uh, true for everything, I think, but at least at this level already. So this is a bird. And the patient or the, the, the participant has to say, this is a bird. And they have to read the lead-in phrase. And now, uh, for English, this is an example, every day the man fishes. 
And the research questions were, um, should we use action naming as well as object naming? We know that action naming is more sensitive, but what we do not know yet is whether we find the same positive language areas under NTMS. If action naming just reveals more positive language areas, then it's fine to leave out object naming if you have no time. Um, if it's more and different areas, then you should include both. Uh, so that's the, the, the other question. Can we detect different cortical areas, uh, sorry, areas involved in the two tasks? Okay. So as I said, we first do a baseline testing to find out whether the patient or the participant recognizes the pictures. When uh, he makes errors here, the items are removed. And then we do uh, an NTMS language mapping um, session. So here you can see how it works. Um, this is in German. Uh, he has to say, uh, das ist ein Kase, das, uh, that is cheese. And so he sees that it in phrase, this is the picture. This is without stimulation. Das ist ein Kase, sorry. Um, now, with stimulation. So what you hear is slurred speech. This is an case, and that's because of the stimulation. We call that a slurred speech error. Uh, here, the, the first one was correct. Das ist ein Spine, that is a spider. That was not very much. Speech arrest, he didn't say anything. By the way, this is Annie Olet, the, the, the author of the fan pop. This is an interesting one. This is without stimulation. Uh, the man takes a bath, he has to say. And then he says, okay. So, he knows that he has to say he takes a bath, but he says the man takes a shower. Why do we know it's wrong? You can say, well, that's correct. Well, well. We, do, we call this a semantic error because it is a semantic error, but also because he says, oh my God, he knows it's wrong. Okay, so that's, uh, that's how, what it looks like. Uh, then the study, the language mapping with the van pop. So it was a multi-center study. Uh, we did it together with uh, the Technological University in Munich in, for German and at King's College for English. And the data that I present today are from German. So we tested the whole brain. Uh, so left and right. And these are the areas that we uh, uh, stimulated, although we didn't uh, use it very frontally and we didn't use it occipitally because that's very painful. We did two baselines to be sure that the participants could uh, name all the pictures. Then each of these points was mapped three times and each hemisphere was mapped twice. Yeah. Uh, we tested 20 healthy participants and uh, what I, as I said, the research questions were, are they equally sensitive object and active naming? And are there, can we find areas that are specific for object and action naming? And those of you who are uh, familiar with the uh, theory of embodiment uh, will certainly expect like we did, although I'm not very much in favor of this, but still um, you expect, of course, different areas for object and action naming. This is what we found. As you can see, it's exactly the same areas but it's just that action name for action naming this area and this area are significantly different from uh, object naming so here we have significant more errors than we have here in the left hemisphere right but you see that everywhere you can disturb the process in the left hemisphere but this was my problem. And this is what I would like to discuss with you. The right hemisphere. In the right hemisphere, well, it was not significantly more or less, but there was no difference between stimulation in the left and the right hemisphere. And we found in the right hemisphere more areas where action naming is significantly more 
disturbed than uh, object naming. Uh, so I'm not surprised that you find areas where action naming is more uh, sensitive um, because that is what other people found and because actions, verbs are more complex than nouns. So I'm not surprised about that. I'm not even surprised about these areas, but I'm very much surprised about the right. I was very much surprised about the right hemisphere. So the main findings were that we found more errors for verbs than for nouns, but the sites are the same. There are no specific sites for nouns or for verbs. But for me, the main finding was, and the most intriguing things, and I'm not going to explain it today because I have no idea why this is the case, but there is no difference between left and right hemisphere. That is, and we are all convinced that um, language is predominantly in the left hemisphere. And we all know that if you get a lesion, a brain lesion in the right hemisphere, you won't have aphasia. But if you give a very small magnetic current, you make some paraphasia in the right with the right hemisphere. So uh, also the error patterns that we found are the same. So we found hesitations in both the left and the right hemisphere. This counted for 30% of the uh, of the errors. And hesitation is when they see the picture and they do not even start to speak, not even the, the, the lead-in phrase. Performance errors, that's the name that neurologists gave to it, but it basically they are articulation errors. That's not surprising that it's left and right because articulation is bilateral. But what is going on? So at the group level with TMS, the word production process can be disrupted both in the right and the left hemisphere for both verbs and for nouns. This confirms in my view, that positive sites, remember that the, the reliability of positive sites when compared to uh, direct cortical stimulation was 40 to 70%. Well, I can understand that if we find so many positive sites in the right hemisphere. So there is no reason to believe that the positive sites in the right hemisphere do not mean that these areas do, do host language, but that this, do not host language, but that in the left hemisphere they do. So I've been thinking about an explanation and it depends very much on who you talk to um, in, in the, the degree in, uh, in which people agree with me um, is very dependent on um, the, the professional background. Okay, so there is a language network that we all agree on and that is spread over the left and the right hemisphere. It's connected through subcortical tracks and you can disturb it, disturb it by TMS. But um, under no, normal circumstances, there is, or when you have a stroke in the left hemisphere, then there is sufficient activation left for the network to function adequately when there is damage in the right hemisphere. So basically it means that even though there are what we call eloquent areas in the right hemisphere, that is they react on, uh, 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 and TMS, it doesn't mean that they play an important role in the language network. And hopefully you hear how difficult it is for me as a linguist, a neurolinguist, to explain what people who are in favor of this explanation, uh, people who are in favor of this explanation. It's very hard for me to explain this because I can't believe it. I, I can't say, well, there is a language network, but it, only the left part, the, the part in the left hemisphere is important. Because then my question is immediately, so this is, this, this also holds for the left hemisphere. So if it holds for the right hemisphere, why not for the left hemisphere? So that's not my favorite explanation, although all neurosurgeons agree on this. Um, theoretically, I don't like it. The second explanation is, that there is a learning effect. So what we did, as I told you, uh, we did two baselines, then we did uh, TMS, and that meant that each item had been named at least nine times overall. And that may mean that there is, after two or three times, there is a learning effect. Although the, the, the order of the, the verbs and nouns was different all the time, it's all randomized. Still, if you see a picture, you do not need to think about it anymore and you know 
maybe immediately what it is. Now, there are, we know about learning effects of verbs. There is a study from a German study uh, from Weber. I think it is from the Indefrei group. Um, and they uh, did a study where they, the, the, the students had to learn new verbs and then they did fMRI and this is what they found. So this is the number of items of verbs that, uh, sorry, um, these are the areas where that are activated uh, when they see the repeated items. So the new verbs that they learned compared to the new verbs that they did not learn. And what you see, to my surprise, is that the left hemisphere is, sorry, the right hemisphere is much rather than the left hemisphere. So maybe it is a learning effect. Of course, in our case, it was not new verbs and it was also nouns, but there is a, apparently a learning effect for words in the right hemisphere. That may also explain the results. Okay. Uh, for the last explanation, the one I like most, I must say, uh, because it's most interesting from a neurolinguistic point of view, uh, let's look at the time course of word production. So I already uh, said that I use interface uh, theory about word production. This is object naming, this is not verbs, this is just picture name, not even a sentence. Um, so according to Indefrei, when you see the picture, you activate the concept, that's a step he ignores, but then after 200 milliseconds, the lemma is retrieved. And 100, second, 100 milliseconds later, the lexeme is retrieved. He doesn't use phonological encoding, but to program the articulation, it takes half a second, and articulation itself takes uh, another 100 milliseconds. So this is the time course. Now, what so, so in between the zero seconds and the 200 seconds, there's also the concept recognition somewhere. Somewhere between here, there is concept recognition, picture recognition, whatever you call it. Now, we stimulate it, as most of the people do, directly when the, patient, when the people saw the picture. Now, remember this. That is, I come back now to the beginning, um, when I said, what do you activate when you see uh, a picture of a cat? You recognize the concept and the information on the concept is stored all over the brain, left and right. So maybe we stimulated too early and we did not disrupt so much the linguistic stages, but rather recognition of the concept. And there is a hint, this is right. Remember that I said that the number of hesitations is about 30% of the errors. That's quite high. And hesitations is when you do not activate anything at all. You are just silent. Even though Krieg said that the best result, I mean, the best result is the highest correlation with uh, direct electrical stimulation during surgery is with zero seconds delay. And you have the lowest percentage of post-op deficits. So after the operation, there are less deficits when you uh, follow this um, uh, zero milliseconds delay rule. But what is the best result? I don't know. I don't know. Theoretically, I think, I, I thought this was the best explanation. Um, but is the best uh, result that you find most positive areas, even if they don't host language? It means that you may leave tissue of the tumor inside. So I don't know. I don't know whether this is the best idea. So my suggestion would be to take the time course of word production into account. So you vary the stimulation onset time in, in, T, in TMS with the timing of the process that you wish to disturb. So if you want to uh, disturb lemma retrieval, so if you're in the yellow area, then maybe you should have a stimulus onset time of 200 milliseconds and 300 milliseconds for lexeme retrieval and so on and so forth. So maybe the stimulus uh, onset time should be varied according to the process of word retrieval. I hope you like this explanation as much as I do. Okay. However, when I presented these results, one of the people who are really good and who are really very much in, uh, into this uh, NTMS uh, 
research, mentioned the study of Solman, he's also from the Munich group. Um, he found more or less the same results for object naming in the right hemisphere. So uh, he only tested the right hemisphere. So, and the problem is that he stimulated 300 milliseconds after stimulus presentation. So you see the picture and then 300 milliseconds later, I would say that's when you tap into lexeme retrieval. Lexemes are in the left hemisphere, so you shouldn't find anything in the right hemisphere, but he does, and in the temporal lobe. So this is probably not the right explanation either, although I still like it most, and I would like to do this with the right and left hemisphere. Okay, to conclude, there is still a lot to learn. It's all in its infancy. We do not know yet why the right hemisphere is so easily disrupted by TMS. We do not know the time course of action naming because I said action naming is clearly more sensitive than object naming. Um, but we only know the time course of object naming and object naming in isolation, not in sentence context. So that's something we need to find out first. And that's what we are working on now with a big EEG experiment to find out the time course for action naming. But I'm sure we will get there in the end. The problem is that I don't know what in the end is. Okay, uh, the VanPop, it's freely available if you want to, uh, to use it for pre-surgical language mapping or interoperative language mapping. It's also used for interoperative language mapping. Um, just send an email to Annie Olert and she will give you uh, all the uh, materials and the uh, instructions. Um, so what I would like to show you now, this you can easily find on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, this is in Utrecht in the Netherlands where a patient, an opera singer is operated. And as you can see, the tumor is in the right hemisphere. Um, and one of his great wishes was of course that he could continue singing after his operation. So this is how they did it. Well, that part they shouldn't cut out. Okay, that's it. I would like to uh, draw your attention to a MOOC, a massive open online course that we made, language testing during awake brain surgery. You can freely follow it. There are much more uh, clips there, uh, much more background information. Uh, it's on futurelearn.com. I would like to thank these people, especially Anne Katrien Olert. She is doing all. She's doing all the work. I've, I've been to the OR several times, and that's it. Uh, the group from uh, King's College in uh, London and the group from uh, Munich and many, many other people who helped making the test, uh, validating the test, etc., etc. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ruling. Uh, as always, uh, you can't hear the audience, but you can, you know, you can visualize them clapping or have an auditory hallucination <laughs> or whatever. Um, we uh, so we have questions from the from the uh, chat. So I'll just uh, start at the top. Um, a question from Claire Axton. Um, so in the beginning, you 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 showed um, uh, neural correlates of different aspects of the picture naming, and you also showed the indifferent picture. So Claire asks, with so many brain regions involved in picture naming, do we really need any other tests? Well, I think this is just. Oh, this was a test for object naming. That's what people usually use. I don't, as I said, I don't like object naming so much because it has nothing to do, well, hardly anything to do with uh, language in daily life. So yes, I think you need many, many more tests, uh, especially if you are uh, testing the patients to find out uh, why, uh, uh, to find out a way to treat the patient. Uh, I think you need to test the word level, the sentence level, uh, nouns, verbs, reading, writing, repetition, the whole lot. Yeah. So even even the, so, I'm just elaborating on that. Even though in your in your models, almost the whole of the left hemisphere was involved in picture naming, right? So you, you might argue, well, that gives us everything. That's right, but these were the brains of twenty people. Exactly. Okay. It was not that all these areas were involved in all people. No, 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 no. Thank you. 
We have a question from Malathi Tothatiri. Uh, the right hemisphere could be involved in selecting between alternatives and there could be more options in the action naming case. More broadly, couldn't action and object naming differ in non-linguistic ways too? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, absolutely, because they refer to different things in life. A uh, table refers to a thing in your uh, in, in your living room, and what you do is an action there, eating, reading, writing, whatever you do at your table. So yes, um, still, but and, and I agree with that. It can be decision whatever, but still, if you have a lesion, a big lesion in the right hemisphere, you can do these tasks. That that's my problem. That you can do these tasks. So it's not so much in what the right hemisphere exactly does to me. To me, it is what process are we disturbing? Maybe it is a selection process, but I'm not sure that you will then use almost your complete right hemisphere to select between meanings. And <clears throat> maybe selection is not very different from what I said, that selection also has to do with the concept. It's at a conceptual level, it's not at the language level. But what surprised me was that the, the number of errors and the kind of errors in the left and the right hemisphere were exactly the same, for both nouns and verbs. I hope that answers her question. I hope so too. We can see if she, if she responds. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Kirana Tsakini asks and says, a very thought-provoking talk, Rolene. Can you introduce a counterbalanced sham condition in your TMS so you do not worry about learning or other bias? Uh, hi, Kirana. Good to hear from you. Um, right now, it would be difficult because it's very noisy. You are tak 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 tak. <laughs> That's what you hear. Uh, so, um, but it is a good idea. I can suggest it for our study. We work closely together, of course, with the firm that develops these. Uh, devices. <coughs> yeah, that is certainly a good idea. Yeah, thank you, Kirana. Thanks. We have a question from Julius Fredrickson. Um, how about distal effects on of NTMS? That is, do we know for sure that localized stimulation in one hemisphere does not interrupt or at least interfere with, for example, homologous regions in the contralateral hemisphere? Yeah, that's what that's the, the, the neurologist's uh, uh, approach. Um, what they told me, what they are convinced of, the people who make these devices, is that it doesn't go any deeper than four millimeters. That's not very deep, and I don't think that's enough to to put a whole um, subcortical track down. But that's what the, what the, that's the, the neurologist's view. That's they think what they do. Uh, we are now doing a study, and well, we have the results, but I can't recapitulate, recapitulate them, uh, where we looked into uh, the connections between the areas that we tested. So we looked at the study, we've almost written it down, uh, where we looked on the basis of uh, NTMS at, at the tracts. But I cannot recall that because it's far beyond neurolinguists' uh, knowledge. <laughs> Uh, we have a, a, a request from Bets uh, Peters or Peters. I don't, I don't know. Uh, would you please put in the chat uh, the email address where we can ask for the Van Pop materials and the name of your course on Future Learn? I suggest that we do that after we're done with the questions, so we can. Okay. 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 And yeah. also, uh, Bets, we will add that information to the uh, YouTube recording. So uh, if you watch the, the the lecture later, you can you can find that information there. But we'll put it in the chat after we're done with the questions. Okay. Um, a question from Trisana um, uh was similar to Julie's question, and I would add another one. So she says, how anatomically precise can you be with TMS in terms of targeting a specific sulcus or gyrus compared to direct cortical stimulation? That's related to the previous question. But I would add, what do we know about the uh, temporal transience of the effect? So how long uh, physiologically does the TMS effect last and because that directly affects your your point the point that you made about the timing yeah um, the effects uh, last very short as soon as you do not so it, you stimulate for it, tuck, 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 it, I think a second and then 
it's over. Immediately after that, they can say the word as soon as you stop. It's supposed to be extremely precise, as precise as uh, direct electrical stimulation. So we're talking about the millisecond level, right? I mean, in your in your model, in the yeah, 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 that, yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. But they hesitate, and then as soon as you stop stimulating, they say the sentence. Yeah. Okay, we have a uh, uh, we have a question from uh, Cindy Thompson. So nice to see you, Rulin. Very it's interesting. Nice to, to read you, Cindy. <laughs> I wonder if the test is controlled for verb argument structure, and if so, if you've looked at responses for verbs of different types. Yeah. Uh, at dear Cindy, of course, we controlled for that. We have um, only action verbs, so no uh, an accusatives or whatever. We have one place verbs and two place verbs. And we did find, uh, to my surprise, I didn't expect it to be so specific, especially, I think, in the middle temporal gyrus, but it may have been a superior temporal gyrus, a much stronger effect for two place verbs than for one place verbs. And that's a study that one of my uh, master students did, and she is writing it down right now. Yeah, there is a difference. We, we just started a PhD project on it. Yeah. Excellent. My surprise, but not to you, Cindy. <laughs> we did have another question from Claire Axton uh, asking if you have plans to test uh, NTMS with patients with brain tumors and or pre-existing aphasia, because I'm assuming you've only done it on healthy participants right now. Uh, no, it's used in clinical practice. It's used in clinical practice a lot. The problem is it's used by neurosurgeons and what's happening. So they, um, and that's how, well, that's how they do neurosurgery in a good center anyway. So they test the patients on several tests, the tests that they are going to use during uh, surgery and they remove the items that the patient cannot name, for example, before surgery not taken into account that the, the behavior is very, the behavior is very uh, variable and that it may be completely different items that he cannot name during surgery. But what can you do? We try to help them as good as possible, but many of the patients do have aphasic problems, never very severe, because the tumors, usually they're young patients, they are, they're all usually below 60. Um, and the brain tumors grow very, very, very slowly. So there is a lot of reorganization. They are never ever severely aphasic. They may have a bit of word finding problems, mild, mildly aphasic at most. And the good thing of NTMS is that you know immediately whether in, in patient with aphasia, whether the error is caused by NTMS or by aphasia, because as soon as you stop stimulating, tak, 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 he can't, na can't name it, and then he can name it. Then it's not the aphasia, then it's the stimulation. Thank yeah. you. We have two short questions uh, from Lorraine Obler. Uh, number one, all verbs are only present tense. Uh, given your work on past tense, I think you'd want to know if different regions were engaged for past tense, though if it's the entire brain tested, one might not see that. And number two, um, was the singer able to sing again after his surgery? And number two, I can immediately give the answer, I don't know. <laughs> But you can find the, 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 it on YouTube and there may be a story behind it now because when I got this video, that was just after they did the surgery. Uh, the other question, interestingly, yes, we did. We used, we tested in English, present and past tense. And we found more errors in past tense, not in specific areas, but overall in healthy participants, more problems in past tense, no difference between regular and irregular verbs. But we only tested till now 18 patients and then there was 18 participants, sorry. And then there was Corona. So yeah. we, we had to stop. I had, I had a little bit of a similar question, uh, which I also typed in the chat box. Uh, and I think you may have alluded to it, but which was related to whether, for example, in your experience, whether you've ever seen that, for example, instrumental verbs would be, the, the, whether their naming would be blocked particularly by you know, NTMS on regions yeah. that you might expect yeah. to be involved with tools. Yeah. So we just checked for it, but we haven't. Uh, so we no, no, we just controlled for it in the test, but we haven't checked the results now. They're yet they're quite new. Yeah. Okay. Another question from Kirana Tapkini: Would the right hemisphere involvement uh, uh, also be attributed to age in the controls? So, 
uh, with aging, people become less lateralized. So would that differ between? Uh, I don't know. We tested um, mainly young doctors. And in I the, have in a follow up. Oh, unless you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, no, no, no. We only did younger people also because, uh, and that, that uh, relates to uh, Lorraine's question, because most of the patients are young. Uh, Lorraine, why are the patients young? The patients that get awake surgery are usually younger, although the, the, the oldest I did was 60 or 65. Um, the, the pro this is mainly done with uh, low-grade gliomas and they are, are they're just more frequent in younger people than in older people and all the people in all the people they grow even slower like all our cells grow slower unfortunately yeah so it, it, it unless you get a high grade glioma but then you have so many so many problems already you get awake surgery but it's it you're usually severely aphasic and you have a lot of epileptic insult and it's 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 another i don't know much about that i only the main student the main patients that i saw were between 25 and 45. thank you yeah um and we get uh, thanks messages in the chat one from malati Tothatiri. so thanks for your answering for the talk so that seems that you have indeed answered the question um, and meanwhile, also Christiana Hulman has uh, entered in the chat the website for the Future Learn uh, Awake Brain Surgery course. Yeah, and by the way, I see that Efinitimu is there. Um, she is the one who did the study, Cindy, to the transitive and intransitive verbs, and who is now doing a PhD project on it. So if you like, you can contact each other and uh, read each other's work. I think with that, we are at the end of the talk and the question time. There's no other questions. Thank you so much, Rulin. Really. OK, my uh, pleasure. It was very nice. I, I will join in more often. <laughs> yeah, do so, yeah. <laughs> Thanks to the audience for attending. And uh, we hope to yeah. see you again in two weeks' time. And we'll be listening to Geza Hartwigsen. Um, spend the weeks wisely. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.